Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Judy Wilkins-Smith. And she's here to share with us her new book, Decoding Your Emotional Blueprint, a powerful guide to transformation through disentangling multi-generational patterns. So everyone knows that we inherit our physical DNA, but did you realize that we also inherit our emotional DNA? This ancestral blueprint of thoughts, feelings, and actions govern how we perceive, expect, and react in our world today. So can we change these patterns? That's something we're going to explore in this discussion. So Judy is a highly regarded organizational, individual, and family patterns expert, a systemic executive coach, trainer, facilitator, thought partner, and leadership conference and motivational speaker. Judy has over 18 years of expertise in assisting high-performance individuals, Fortune 500 executives, and legacy families to end limiting cycles and reframe challenges into lasting breakthroughs and peak performance. So welcome to the show, Judy Wilkins-Smith. Thank you, Marianne. It's lovely to be with you. Oh my goodness, what an honor it is to have you here to talk about this book. So I've got to ask, like, what inspired you to write this? (laughs) <laughs> Lots of, of attendees at my, to my live events who kept saying, where's the book? Until I got tired of hearing, where's the book? But aside from that, really, really, it was about being able to take this information, which sometimes seems a little mysterious, and put it into context and into a, a, in such a way that people could pick up the book, read it, understand it clearly, and start doing that work themselves. So it was about putting it in an everyday language. And I really wanted to do that. Well, I'm so glad that you did because I think it touches on just such an important topic. So how did you even get involved in this topic? Uh, I moved from South Africa, moved over to the US and uh, my father was killed. And it was a case of write books or go crazy. And I decided that writing books was probably a better idea. So started writing books, was looking for a piece of information, stumbled into this work and a gentleman who said, come and learn the work and I'll help you with a book. So I went and learned the book and at least learned the work and got no help with the book. But uh, that was sort of the beginning and then discovered only much later that this work had its origins, in fact, in South Africa and with a Zulu tribe, which made it even stranger because when I left South Africa from a teaching hospital, The gentleman who gave my farewell was a Zulu gentleman. And he said to me, you may be leaving us, but you'll find a way to represent us in the world. Of course, I laughed and thought nothing of it. And I do it every day. It's just so interesting how these synchronicities come together. And and I'm so sorry for your loss. I, I know that that's just, it's horrible losing a loved one. And just to see that you are doing this work and doing as the Zulu teacher was telling you, I mean, how how inspiring is that? Absolutely. And, you know, yes, it was terrible. It, as you know, losing a loved one, like you said, is not good. But when people say to me, how is there any good in that? Because I always say there is good in everything. Um, I think when he died, he, instead of me sitting around doing everyday normal things, I had to get up and make something happen. And I always say uh, that was his final gift. Well, what a gift that is. So when we talk about decoding your emotional blueprint, what does that mean? So an emotional blueprint, first of all, what is emotional DNA? We all inherit physical DNA. Most people don't understand that they also inherit emotional DNA. Your patterns of thoughts, feelings, actions, inactions, reactions, interactions. And these happen as a result of an event that may happen somewhere in the family system, possibly generations ago. And there are decisions or not decisions made around that, which create language and sayings and feelings and actions. And those very faithfully generate down. It creates an imprint on the system that becomes the blueprint then for generations of behavior. And that's your emotional blueprint. 
Well, thank you for explaining that and, you know, and going into the emotional DNA. And, and so you're saying that this is something we can inherit for generations. So what does that look like? So you come to me and you say, you know what? I'm always sad. And I'm always waiting for something to go wrong. Even when things are going really well, I know that if I get too joyful, something terrible is going to happen. And I say, well, has something terrible happened? No. Okay. Let's look at your mom and dad and let's look further back in the system. And we discover that, oh, wait a minute. Three generations ago, there was a great big family celebration and great grandma and great grandpa were there with all the kids and everybody was super happy. They'd had a great year. And when nobody was looking, the youngest one slipped out and drowned. And so the saying became, don't get too happy because tragedy is going to follow. And this goes down through the generations and suddenly you don't understand why every time something good is happening, you have this dread that something else is coming to. But that's what it is. Now, add to that that you may not speak about that child that was lost because it's too painful. And now you've created an exclusion in the system and family systems or any system it doesn't like that. So now what happens is it seeks solution or it seeks inclusion through all of the later members by echoing those thoughts and feelings until somebody goes looking and says, where is this? What happened? And they see the missing child or the, the grandmother and grandfather, and those are brought back into the system consciously. And at that moment, you no longer need to carry that pattern because you realize it happened to them, not me. And I can make a different choice here. So when we look at systems, what other systems are there other than family? Gosh, so many. Um, you are part of so many systems from before you're born until after you die. Religious systems, ethnic systems, organizations, nations, uh, international organizations, global ways of thinking, money. Money is one of my favorites, by the way. It's incredibly misunderstood, but an amazing system. So we have all of these systems and we're very, very good at navigating each one. You don't go into a church and cuss and you don't go into a bar and pray. We're very good at adapting and sensing into those different systems. And the whole point of that is to make sure that we feel like we belong. And when we don't feel like we belong, we feel very much at risk. And yet sometimes that's what we have to do to expand the current system. Do you ever come across people who say, well, I was adopted, so I don't really know my family history, but at the same time, I feel like I'm different than the family I grew up with? Well, here's the, here's the thing. My daughter's an adoptee. So <laughs> the short answer is yes, I do. And what I say to them is this, go and have a look. Where do you look different? Where do you sound different? What actions or mannerisms do you have that are different? Where do you think they came from? Because they didn't happen in a vacuum. You're twice as lucky. You have the, the ones that you've adopted in or been adopted into. So you have all of that wealth to draw on. But you also have your biological parents, whether you know them or not. And it's a little bit, people say, yeah, but how can you know? It's not that much different than physical DNA. You don't necessarily know that your great, great aunt had blue eyes and long brown hair. And yet here you are. It's much the same with emotional DNA. But when you learn to understand it and look at it and see where it is in your own life, You'll see that if you timeline your own life, there are patterns that are consistent with who you are not in the adopted family. And so you start to look at those patterns and see which of those need to stop and which ones are trying to change and become something extraordinary through you. Now, do you find that as people are looking at some of the systems that are in their life, how can they best identify the ones that? maybe they're just completely unaware of? I think the best way to, to do that always is to notice where do you get annoyed, irritated, frustrated, hopeless, sad, depressed, any of those big places where you don't, you don't feel great or conversely, other places where you feel super empowered, absolutely drawn to, inspired. You want to start looking there because when you are drawn to do something, 
and you don't understand why, sometimes that lies in prior generations. And that can be both good and bad. And we carry these again, as I said, quite unconsciously. Uh, there is a lot of this has to do, by the way, with genealogy. I call this genealogy 2.0. 2.1 says, or 1.0 says, here's where you belong. This work shows you how and why that matters. So when you start looking into that genealogy, you suddenly discover, oh, I'm not the only one who gets angry about. Generations ago, there was. And we're making unconscious connections. So those angers and feelings are ways of saying to you, hey, wake up. There are clues here for you. Take a look. You've got all of this treasure. So it's looking at that. And then looking at things like mottos or sayings in the family. Where did they come from? Are they really yours? Or did they come from somewhere else? How do you do with money or relationships? Is it only you who reacts this way to money and relationships? Or are there other people in your family who react the same way? So whose pizza might you be eating? <laughs> that makes a lot of sense there when you look at it. Because a lot of times you hear people talk about how they wish to change how their life is. And I would think a lot of that has to do with the systems they grew up with, right? It does. And here's the beautiful thing about that. When I work with people in, and, and I do systemic work, one of the first pieces they learn is acknowledging what is. In other words, what is right now, without wishing for it or wanting for it to be different, what is right now? And when you can look at that, we can see the patterns. What is it that wants to stop right now? But then in answer to your question, what is it that my, is my deepest heart's desire? What do I wish? How would I like it to be? Because in the, the frustrations and irritations are the echoes of the past. But in the longing and the heart's desire is the call of the future. So that's the one that pulls you past all of those old patterns and pulls you into the future and often shows you what your purpose has been all along. It's been staring at you and you missed it. Is this what they call systemic work? Absolutely. Systemic work and constellations. So systemic work is the study of you within a system because you didn't happen in a vacuum. And if there are pieces in the system that are imbalanced, as I said before, it seeks balance or inclusion in later members. So what's happening is the system is saying, we couldn't fix this. You can do something different with it. Or we couldn't go beyond this level. You can. What are you going to do? So it's really a big adventure. I was real impressed in your book. You talk about you, you have these sentences that help people identify, well, maybe there's some stuff to here that I need to work on. You know, when you talk about you can have love or money, but not both. Yes. You know, it's Systemic these stories. Sentences. Yeah. Yes. yes. We all have them, right? Um, don't be greedy. Money doesn't grow on trees. Watch out. If you uh, look at money, you'll lose everything. No. But we've been told that. So we, because we're told something and it imprints on us and it becomes the truth, only it's not the truth, it's your truth. And you can change that anytime you want to. So you mentioned constellation. So what is that so our listeners can really identify with that? Sure. So a constellation is, is one of the big breakthrough parts of systemic work. Instead of you sitting and trying to figure it all out in your head or write it down on a piece of paper and read it and then chuck it, what we do is we dimensionalize an issue or a family system. So perhaps you come to me and you say, I struggle with, with relationships. And I go, okay, talk to me about that. And we have a bit of a history or an intake. And so we identify that part of the bits of this issue could be you, mom, dad, siblings, aunts, uncles, whoever it is. And at a live event, what I will say to people is, okay, so I want you to pick someone for your mom, your dad, your siblings, yourself, maybe that aunt you were talking about or that grandmother. And now I want you to place them in the room in relationship to each other the way that it is for you. So now they're giving me a 3D picture of the way that it feels for them or, or the way they see it. 
But what they don't realize is they've just popped that whole system into 3D because now I can look at it and say to them, ha, huh, so mom and dad are at opposite ends of the room. What happened? Oh, well, and they'll tell me the story. Um, your one sibling is right in the middle of everything. Yeah, she's the super glue. So now they're starting to tell the story of who they are and what's happening. Okay, let's look at relationships. You're, you tell me you're the one who always ends them. Yes. Why? Because I'm not getting hurt. Who was? Well, mom didn't marry her first love. He hurt her badly. So we set up mom in the first love. And then I said to you, so you mean like this? You go, whoa, yes. And then what will happen is I might say to you, oh, so if you look at that first love, yes, I feel drawn to him. Do you understand why? No. Because without that first love stepping out, your dad didn't step in and you weren't born. So you owe that one your life. And it's that they start to pop the insights and go, oh, my goodness. And then they start to realize, you know, this feeling may not be mine. I've heard mom say, don't trust a man or don't trust your first love. Oh, maybe that's why I'm struggling. And so what they're doing is they're seeing it, hearing it, feeling it, touching it. And they're having a multi-sensory experience of what normally goes on in their head. And because it's multi-sensory and they can see it around them and make different connections, that becomes an embodied experience that then starts rewiring the brain. And it, you can see a physical jolt in the body once, maybe twice. And people will say to me, oh, my goodness, my thoughts are changing and my body doesn't feel the same. No, you're rewiring the system beginning with you. And so you're having this transformational aha moment and people will often say, how have I not been able to solve this in 20 years and I'm doing this now and I can feel it? That's precisely it. You've incorporated everything, feelings, thoughts, actions, sight, and it becomes this embodied, powerful experience. It's so interesting in rewiring our emotional DNA. Um, one thought comes to mind is when we unravel one piece, do other pieces tend to kind of slip away as well? Betcha, betcha. Absolutely. Yes. That whole construct that you've had in place of mom didn't love me because she didn't ever look at me. When we suddenly show you that maybe mom lost a child and couldn't get over it, you go, oh, wait a minute, you mean it wasn't about me? No, it wasn't about you. So, so I'm not the bad kid. No, you're not the bad kid. So I don't have to just, now you can see the whole process starts to unravel and, and they get to the end and go, oh my goodness, my life's just changed. Yep. And if this is a multi-generational piece, you've just in that moment begun to turn the entire system around and the entire belief system around. And now not only are you rewiring for yourself and those who come after you, but suddenly sometimes the villain in the piece wasn't. Isn't that interesting? It really yep. shifts perspectives. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So I know you, you, we started this conversation off talking uh, just in regards to the Zulu nation and how does this come full circle with the Zulu nation? Who really founded this type of work? Oh, this was Bert Hellinger. He was a, a missionary from Austria or Germany, uh, and he went down to South Africa to, as he says, tame the Zulus. But the Zulus tamed him. And he found it super interesting to notice that when he worked with them, they didn't have neuroses. In fact, when there was dissent in, amongst them, they would go back into their system to see what was happening with the ancestors that was influencing them now. And then he went on, there were two other ladies who introduced him to the work, and he combined some of Virginia Satir's work, but his big breakthrough came when he didn't sculpt. He positioned people as I described to you in a constellation, and then noticed that when he did that, and this is something that people go, how, until they've stood in and been a representative, um, the representatives would start to move or they would say something that was very accurate. And people would say, this is not possible. But of course it's possible. If you 
watch it, the TV and you see somebody going through something horrendous, you cringe. Or if you're watching somebody on The Voice or Idol and you see them have their moment, you get goosebumps and your heart kind of bursts open. You're sensing into their system. We do it all the time and we do it very accurately. And he understood that. That's just so phenomenal hearing that. So when we do a constellation and we shift perspectives, does this enable us to operate in a like a whole new person? And if so, why? It doesn't. And there are a couple of reasons. The first one is 90% of the time, all you are doing is regurgitating ancient history. We think we have free will. You don't. Not unless you know what lives in your system. You're just faithfully repeating all of the patterns that came before. And you have a very predictable future. The minute you start to rewire and observe a new pattern into reality, you no longer have a predictable future. You're out of ancient history. And now you're creating a super present and a different future. And that's why. Suddenly when that happens, so there are, there are three other things that happen. When that happens, quite often you'll suddenly find that your heart opens. So you, you may feel a little bit of a grin or you may feel peaceful, whatever that feels like. And when that happens, you'll, you'll also realize your creative brain is switching on. Now you're starting to think new thoughts that were not possible before because it wasn't allowed in the family system pattern. And then you might notice that your gut settles and it hasn't been settled for years because it's been carrying the family nervous system with it. But the minute you start to rewire, now you're the pilot and you're the one driving this particular direction. And when your head, your heart and your gut are aligned, that's when the incredible starts to happen. And if you add to that elevated emotion like gratitude, appreciation, joy, wow, enthusiasm, it amps that up and suddenly you're accomplishing things you did not know you could do. What an empowering practice that is. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne and special guest, Judy Wilkins-Smith. We'll be right back after these messages. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient Secrets of Manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. (music) 
I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood for providing the music for our show today. You can visit his website at guitarfulness.com to listen to all of his great albums, to download his music, and to be part of his community. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Judy Wilkins-Smith, who's sharing her new book, Decoding Your Emotional Blueprint. Now, Judy, before I went for a break, I mean, we're talking, there's so much great science and research that's done in your book. You have so many case studies. Why don't you share some of the science with us right now? Two, two distinct ones, neuroscience, because neuroscience teaches you very quickly that you have neuroplasticity. You're not locked in like we used to think. You can rewire your brain anytime you want to. It's called one new thought, one new feeling, one new action. You keep rehearsing that, you're laying down a new neural pathway. The interesting piece with that is that in a trauma, if you have a traumatic incident, you can lay that down almost instantly. If you ask somebody what they were going through, They will tell you what was happening, what time of day it was, who was there, what colors were happening, all of those bits. What we don't know or don't teach ourselves is that that's what athletes do too, except they do it the other way around. They don't wire for tragedy, they wire for triumph. What does that look like? What does that feel like? How will I feel? What is the track there? What does this step feel like? What does that step feel like? And they actually embody it. So they embody it the same way that you would a trauma, only in the opposite direction. So that's the neuroscience piece. And that's why this work, by the way, is practical and easy. You don't have to eat the whole elephant. It's one new thought, one new feeling, one new action at a time. So that's neuroscience. Then we get to epigenetics. And epigenetics is the piece that I spoke about earlier. If an event is significant enough, it creates an imprint on the system that becomes a blueprint for generations of suffering or generations of behavior. And you see this with cases like the Great Dutch Hunger Winter. You see it with the Holocaust. And more recently, you see it with 9-11, where they've studied women who were pregnant with children at the time of the events. And they look at the genetic markers that are activated. And with 9-11, for example, they've noticed that there are elevated PTSD markers. They were elevated in the mothers and they're elevated in the children. In the Great Dutch Hunger Winter, they've observed changes that have lasted four generations and counting. That's just, it's remarkable how all that's so connected and how it influences our our work today. So I know in your book, you talk about practical magic. What does that mean and how does that work for us? Okay, so practical magic. I always say to people, you are a master magician. Nobody thought to point it out, but you are. So the first thing I ask them is, do you watch horror movies? And they all go, no, 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 no. And I say, hmm, but you tell yourself horror stories about yourself all day long and you believe them and your body knows it because you say, you know what? You are so stupid. You should never have done that. And your body goes, oh, my goodness, and you get sweaty and your stomach starts to cringe and you go, I I will never do that again. I'm so dumb. Okay. That's your new reality and truth because you've made it that way. You can do the opposite. You can take that library of self-doubts and and self-frustrations and unlock that and begin to identify where you are really good at something. And instead of just saying, yeah, I might be good at that moving on, really listen to it. Look at it. Notice how it feels in your body. And then when you get ready to want to create something or make it happen, you start building a library around what it is that you want to make happen. Because the magic is this. When your brain can tell your body a story it believes, that becomes your new truth. And we're that powerful. Mm, I love that. I love that. And we can rewrite that story. You can totally rewrite that story. One of my favorites was the guy I was at school with in in primary school in South Africa. He was a class clown. 
and they couldn't get him to do anything other than be funny. And he was, his parents were despaired because they were pretty well to do people, but this guy was just a goofball, didn't do particularly well at school either. So he goes down to the principal's office one day as a perk. Because if you were good, you got to go and do filing or stuff in, in the principal's office because that was like an acknowledgement of your responsibility. So this guy goes down there and uh, he's going through all the filing and he gets to his own file. This is a true story. He gets to his own file and he looks at it and he sees his IQ is 90. And he goes, oh, my goodness, I'm a genius. Not realizing that it's not out of 100. <laughs> goes goes back to his class and he was literally never the same again. He was the smartest kid in the class. He was the go-to kid for everything. Yeah, he was funny, but he he went straight to the top of the class because he reckoned if he was that smart, he better not waste his brain power. And he became the, the top attorney in South Africa. And he oh. only very, very much later realized that it wasn't out of 100. <laughs> But he made it out of 100, you know? He made it out of 100, and he made it mean, I am super smart. Therefore, I had better do really well. And he applied himself, and we are all like that. Well, I think that gives us great hope, because if we're like that, just imagine what we can do. You know, I'm thinking with with just changing our perspective. Very much. We're taught we have a full language. We're actually born with a full language. And then very quickly, it's chopped into a half language. And the half language is the language of suffering, limitation, can'ts, shoulds, musts, won'ts. And that's what we grow up with. Be humble. Only nobody tells you what humility or being humble really is. We all think it's called hide yourself under a bushel. Uh, Nobody tells you. The other half of your language truly exists. You are smart. You are capable. You are an adventure. If you wire your brain, your heart, and your gut correctly, you can do anything you want. So we sit with a hidden half of our language, and we listen to the half that is highlighted. Well, I mean, my goodness, if we had young people doing this, just imagine how far advanced we would be. Incredibly. And I would. there, there is no age limit to this, which is what I love. I see people of all ages, and when they get that aha, they also realize they're busted in the land of victims because they're doing it to themselves. Imagine that. Well, and so I know right now we're going through this, what they call an epidemic of loneliness. So how does somebody who's maybe anxious or lonely, or maybe they're feeling like they get panic attacks, how do they fit into all this? You know, I love the epidemic of loneliness because it taught us one thing very quickly. We all said we don't need each other until we couldn't give each other hugs anymore. And then we discovered exactly the opposite was true. What I say to people when they're having panic attacks is whose panic attack is it? It may not be yours. Who was first lonely? That may not be yours, but it's going to feel like it's yours. So if you wanted it to be different, what is the one new feeling you could have? What is the one new capability you could identify? Sometimes that's hard, but it's there. And what is the one new action you could take? And with the panic attacks, it's to really sit and understand that there's a strong possibility that this is not just your nervous system. It's a multi-generational nervous system. And how do I want to change that? So it's to say to yourself, for all the ones who couldn't, how can I in just one way? And if you're lonely, how can, how can I recognize others who are lonely and create belonging? Because loneliness is a, is a feeling of not belonging. How can I create belonging? In fact, some of the very best people I see are doing that started out as very lonely people who didn't feel like they had a place. So instead of being a victim or feeling like a victim, they created one. I love that. It asks for us to really get out of our own comfort zone and be creative in our own way. And into our magic. We've got it. 
honestly, it's there. It's, it's genuinely there. You've just got to tap into it. So what are some of the gifts that we can look for as we do this work and are working through just all of this, um, you know, emotional DNA that we've been wired with? So don't be so sure that what you're seeing is the whole truth. For example, um, one of my stories that I gosh so much is about the lady who came in and said all she ever got was little drops of love. That's all. But then when we had a look, that's all her parents had to give her. And suddenly those little drops of love were incredibly wealthy jewels. Be careful of what you are classifying as wrong or not good enough or I only. And have a look at even if you got, if, if all you got from your parents was life, that's a pretty significant gift. What are you going to do with it? And I think the other thing for people to recognize is there's no such thing as a train smash. And there's no such thing as you being a wreck. You are a remarkable life, period. Next sentence. All you have to do is be able to see it or more accurately, be willing to see it because we're very willing to to go down on ourselves or be miserable because everybody does it. Then we feel like we belong. Don't do that. What powerful, just a powerful sentence that is and powerful information, you know, that people can look at as they move through this process and really claim their own life. Because a lot of times we're actually living like it, in, in what I got from your book is living our ancestors' lives. Totally living your ancestors' lives loudly and proudly and believing it's yours and it's not. <laughs> and the ancestors are going, oh my goodness, will she just take a different step here? system is waiting for you to do it differently or or add to it. So what are some ways we can pivot to make these aha moments and changes with our emotional DNA? First, so first look at what you don't want, what you want to solve. When you pivot, it's usually you're pivoting from one pattern to another pattern. Now, at all times in your systems, there are patterns trying to stop and start. So you want to look at what is the pattern trying to stop? What do I need to stop? Then look at where did that come from? And even if you don't know, find one thing you can thank it for. What did it give you? Even if all it gave you was the annoyance to do something different, that is a gift. It gave you movement. Then have a look at what do I really really want. But I don't mean want to want. I mean, really want. Because if you really want it and you really invest in it, you will get there. And again, we do that all the time. You think of the ice cream you want or the vacation you want to take. It's no different. People say to you, no, you know what? You shouldn't take that vacation right now. It's not a good time. And you go, I'm going. Nobody's going to stop you. That is just a different version of what we're talking about. And if you keep applying, what don't I want and what do I want, or stop and start, you're going to find, oh, and by the way, the minute that you start wanting something, be prepared for all the little voices to tell you why you can't have it. Everybody here says, and they say to me, what am I supposed to do with my little voices? They're not your little voices. Those are ancestral voices telling you how they didn't get it right. Thank them politely, put it down, and focus on the voices that are saying to you, of course you can do it. Come, come and have a look at this. This is fun. Listen to that. Man, the voice of the ancestors are telling us that they can't do it right, so we can't do it right. Wow, that's it's really all powerful. All the cautionary tales in there, all the cautionary tales. And what you've got to do is turn around and say, I get you didn't get it. But because of all of you, I have a chance to do it differently. Thank you. And you'll find those little voices go, well, fine. We'll watch. So how big an impact do does our language have on us? So the words we say and what we say. Is there, is there an expression big enough to say huger than huge? It's 
huge. And for a number of reasons, it's not just that old thought of if you say something negative, down you go. No. In your language are all of your ancestors. The words that you speak and the actions you take began in the, your, the mouths and the bodies of your ancestors. So when you're talking, even if you don't know them, pay attention to your hot language, your idiosyncratic language, your um, over-the-top language. In that are all of the patterns that you're looking for. When you begin to understand that, you can start changing the way you express yourself. So I'll give you an example. I had somebody who walked in who said to me, oh, my goodness, on the way to see you this morning, it was utterly catastrophic. I was almost wiped out. I only narrowly averted disaster. My boss almost decimated me. It was utter chaos. And I'm going, whoa. And I said to her, what happened? She said, well, I was a little bit late for work, and then I, I nearly ran a red light. My boss was a bit irritated. And I said to her, that's not what came out of your mouth first. Where is this catastrophe in your family? And she looked at me and she said, oh, I never thought of that. My mother and I outran a volcano. My brother and father did not. It's contained in the language. We are telling the stories of what happened in the language, but we then use it to perpetuate our own patterns. So if you've got words that you keep repeating or over-the-top language or, or if you react disproportionately to the event at hand, stop. You've just hit a systemic pattern. So how do we build a sentence of resolution then for these systemic patterns that we have? Okay, so there are two things. There's the sentence of resolution is a concluding sentence. I'm too small for this. I can't do this anymore. This has to stop. It's really bringing the pattern to a close. You guys all spent your money all the time. I can't do that anymore. You're making a statement that closes that pattern out. Then you move to what you call, which is the next step, a sentence of re solution. In other words, a new sentence. You all spent your money. This has to stop. I'm going to start learning the language of money. I want to build wealth. That's the new sentence. And the minute you do that and your brain goes, yeah, I want to build wealth and your heart goes, oh, that feels nice. And your gut goes, yeah, baby, you've just locked it in. Now you're going to find ways to make that a reality. And it begins here. And here's the way that you know you're doing it right. You either feel like you've got a fire lit under you, or you've got a bit of a giggle, or you know you're on an adventure. And it's not just stretching you. You feel really good about it at the end of the day. You have a whole section that talks about um, unhealthy relationships and also creating healthy partnerships. What does creating a healthy partnership look like? Creating healthy partnerships is when we stop saying, you complete me. Often that means I'm going to connect with you in the wound. But if I outgrow it, we're in trouble. Or I'm going to connect with you the way that my mother and grandmother did. Uh Uh-oh. Or I'm a mama's boy or a daddy's girl and you're going to be the next version of mom or dad. Not helpful. To create a healthy one, you want to see what patterns live in your family. And again, what wants to stop and what wants to start. Hey, I'd really like a relationship where I can marry the one I love. All the other women in our family had arranged marriages or or didn't marry the ones they loved. So I suppose that's my lot. No, it's not. Oh, okay, so I'd like to be the first one to marry the person I love. Now, you'll often find that people go, yeah, but I don't know if that's possible. No, of course not, because the the system has a very, very strong influence on us. It's got what we call a systemic pull, and often we're sitting in a systemic trance. It's like hypnosis. It's familiar it's pleasant or it's known. Sometimes it's not pleasant, but it's known. And so we subside into it. But then all of a sudden we go, but I really want to marry the one I love. And we 
do that and nobody comes from the skies and smites us on the head with a piece of two by four and suddenly everybody else in the family is going, hey, wait a minute. She just did something completely different and she didn't die. Let's try that. So now you're rewiring and it's, it's very different. And, and so now you, you go, well, okay. So if I could do that in relationships, what else could I add? And now you start to build that effect of I can, not we can't. When you say in our family or we, you are caught in the system. When you say I am, you are starting to live your life. So I understand that this work is for people who maybe feel stuck or are overcoming trauma. What other um, things can people identify with that this would help them with? I was going to say, no, no, no. This is, well, I suppose it is for people who feel struck or or stuck or been traumatized, but this Mm -hmm. is very much more. This is about taking you to the next level, the next level, the next level, because there are many levels. This is adventure work. This is work. I do this work every day with top C-suite executives because they begin to understand that they don't have limits. They begin to understand that they can be visionary leaders in addition to their hard skills. This work is for people who go, I know there's more to life than this. And I know I have more capability. That's this work. Uh, This work is for people who go, I want to transform X, Y, Z. That is this work. This is work that takes you to the next level of being as a human being or perhaps something above what we call just human. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me on that because I I notice that you have so much in your book that talks about success and work and it's important to um, really give honor to that as well, because I felt that those were such important pieces. As we learn this work, is this something that can be taught to like our children or those that we, you know, maybe our loved ones? Yes, 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 yes. And absolutely. Yes. Starting with language and actions, your children will follow you. So what are you passing on to your children? Watch the patterns that you don't love in you that you wish you didn't have and start changing them for you because your children will change with you. Tell your children the other hidden uh, language or the other half of hidden language. You're smart, you're capable, but don't give them just arrival trophies. Anchor it to things that they can feel it with. Teach them to watch their language. When they start to say, I'm stupid, ask them where they heard that. Well, daddy says it. Okay, daddy, so now we're two generations saying that. Do we really want to say that? Where are you smart? Start teaching them to pivot to their higher self instead of, as we have for a very long time, going into the sleep of our lower self. It's incredibly important. Also teach them there's no such thing as a train smash and also teach them you're not a victim and there is always, no matter what's happening, there is always a gift. You've just got to find it. So, okay. um, Judy, I know you have many events coming up. I do. And you have one coming up in August. I do. I have the August one in Dallas, which is the emotional DNA. And that is that foundational piece of this work. It really teaches people to not just walk into a constellation and go, that was amazing. It teaches them to understand what's happening, how it's happening, what the premise is of this work, how to use it for themselves, and how to use it for their communities and clients. And that one is in Dallas, in Richardson, I think it's at the Renaissance Hotel, from August the 5th through the 7th. So that is that is the August one. Um, and then just very gently and quickly, the one in November is the Disney one. And people often ask about that. So just to be aware. Do you have any upcoming events that are um, virtual that people can attend? I do. Actually, this coming Saturday, uh, this Saturday is a Q&A. And then uh, they can also find me on the Shift Network. I'm teaching uh, classes on Shift Network at the moment, and they're very welcome to join those. They will get, I've done already three classes, but they can download those and listen to them. So there are those. Um, 
I think that's about it at the moment. And of course, a number of, of different TV stations. But yeah, those are the big ones at the moment. Well, Judy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Gosh, it was such fun. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, thank you, Judy. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Decoding Your Emotional Blueprint, a powerful guide to transformation through disentangling multi-generational patterns. If you'd like to learn more about Judy, her work, and her upcoming events, visit her website at judywilkins-smith.com for more information. Decoding Your Emotional Blueprint is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers, and of course support our indie bookstores. You can also purchase Decoding Your Emotional Blueprint at the publisher, Sounds True. Just visit SoundsTrue.com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we... Make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.